The things, another thing, since you're asking about the path of least resistance, there are three things that we've identified so far that contribute to that path. We call them contributing factors. And one of them, and I, I, I'm so disappointed that more people don't think about this, is the stiffness of musculature. And, and, and it's the relative stiffness. Now, you know, everybody knows if they raise, try to do a straight leg raise, they feel the resistance of the hamstrings. But guess what? Every muscle has that stiffness. And I happen to have a couple springs here, so I'll show you what I mean. If you have, let's say you've got hip flexors like this spring, and you can see it's big and it's stiff, and you have hip uh, abdominals like this spring, this spring, when it gets stretched, is going to move the other spring. Yeah. It's not going to stretch itself. Mm -hmm. It's not short. It's just stiffer than. Stretching this is never going to change it. Mm -hmm. Stiffening this will, so that you get a situation that looks more like this. Mm -hmm. So one is the relative stiffness yeah. of, of musculature. The, another factor is what we call relative flexibility and that pertains to the joint itself like we talked about if your glenohumeral joint becomes hypermobile and the and the head of the humerus spins around rather than staying centered like it should that, that that's changing in the joint so there's more relative flexibility in that joint and we have a, a, a syndrome called anterior glide so the head of the humerus anteriorly glides where it shouldn't glide like that. It's excessive, and you can see it with numerous activities as well as position. So what is the joint itself doing? What's happened to it? And then this factor that I sort of alluded to before, it's called the pattern of activation that's connected with motor learning. So you put all those together, and they're highly interactive, all of them contributing to this path of least resistance.